Okay. <laughs> All right, so we are here at the SciMic stage. We are talking to scientists all day. I'm gonna do it tomorrow as well. Today we have uh, Dr. Melanie Mitchell, and she's an expert in AI. She's a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. She's been an editor and an author um, of six books. Um, and we are gonna talk about, we're gonna have some slides. We're gonna look at her research. We're, we're gonna actually be in the know. But I'm gonna start with um, can you give us like the landscape of AI, like right now? Like I, I watched a talk of yours and you talked about how things have changed in the last five years just dramatically. So can we talk about that, like the landscape of the last five years? Yeah, so you know, we've gotten to what's now called generative AI, which is things like chatbots, like ChatGPT, systems now that can generate images for, and videos from text. And it wasn't like that five years it ago. It was no, not, it was, there were such systems, but they have improved so much, so dramatically over the last several years. Yeah. And so like, how do you personally, when you're doing your books, when you're doing talks, how do you talk about AI in a positive way, you know, <laughs> and, and to like kind of respond to the naysayers of AI, like anxiety? Well, I, I talk about why I think AI is going to be extremely beneficial in many ways and Let's already do it. has. Okay, you give know. me some examples. Oh, okay, so um, one, one example is just speech recognition, being able to talk to your phone and have it, you know, input a text or an email that way. Mm -hmm. And for people, you know, anyone who has a disability and has trouble typing, whatever, that's just a godsend. You know, we have many other AI technologies that are almost invisible in our lives today. Translation between languages, you know, if you want to communicate with somebody. Uh, we, we have, you know, AI systems sort of guiding us while we drive around, telling us where to go. You know, it's, it, 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 it's a lot of things that we don't even realize are powered by AI. And in the very near future, I think there's going to be a lot more. Is there a... An, um AI technology that has actually like blown you away, like you did not expect we would be at this level right now. Yeah, I, I think even back in the, you know, 15 years ago when speech recognition really started taking off, I was blown away by it. And I was so surprised that speech recognition was accomplished without the system being able to understand in some human-like sense what you were saying. It could just transcribe your speech. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that's just with a huge amount of data, learning from data at the scale that these systems are learning, is very powerful, a lot more powerful than anybody ever thought. And of course, ChatGPT is astounding in what it can do. And these new systems that can draw images and photographs and so on are, are also very, very surprising. I, I watched an interview of yours and you, t you talked, or I think it was a conference, and you talked about how there's questions of researchers, AI researchers, five years ago, and those questions aren't the same now, right? Of like what you're actually researching. Can you give us some examples of the differences between those questions? Right, so I think five or 10 years ago, people were asking, you know, could a system that's just trained on language, you know, without any giving any grammatical rules or the kinds of things we learn about language in school, could it learn to produce grammatical sentences in fluent language? And now the answer is obviously yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, which is maybe no longer even surprising. I mean, I think it was, would have been back then. Yeah. But, now people are asking sort of what's going on under the hood of these systems and how do how intelligent are they and what do we really even mean by intelligence yeah and i is is that the next step i th i think i was talking to another ai researcher and she said it's some of it is very black box. Like we don't actually know what's happening with the software we created. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And it's not only you and me, it's the people at OpenAI who actually train these systems don't know how exactly it's working. It's a very, very complex system with a huge number of sort of moving parts, if you will, um, that's being trained on billions and billions of words. And after it's trained, 
it can do some things and we right. can't explain, we can't explain and they can't explain why it does them the way it does. Right, but, and that's where the anxiety comes from, right? Like people are like, if we don't know how it's doing it, what will it do next? How do you respond to that? I say that's absolutely right. <laughs> okay. You can't predict often what these systems are, are going to do wrong. Right. And therefore they present some dangers. Right. And, and but how are we going to mitigate those dangers? What? Ooh. Well, that's... They, it doesn't want us to. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the billion-dollar question, and I yeah. don't think anyone has a good answer. You know, we've seen this phenomenon of deep fakes. Yes. And deep fakes are now in images, they're in audio, they're in video, and they're really hard to spot why when something's created by a machine and when it's created by a human or, you know, a real, taking a picture of a real event versus an AI-generated event. And or an AI-generated human. Yeah. No one has a good solution. I mean, there's a lot of research on how to mitigate this, but it's not going to come all from technology. It has to come from, uh, you know, legislation. It has to come from regulation and all of that. Yeah. Which is, you know... Science without walls. Absolutely. <laughs> well, so let's actually talk about that. Let's talk about your own research. And I am kind of want to go at it with that frame. Like, in your own research, in your own AI work, what kind of interdisciplinary kind of anti-siloing has helped yours, your field? Well, you know, AI used to be very much inspired by how people think. You know, cognitive science was... It, sort of they, people at AI and cognitive science went to the same conferences and talked to each other and inspired each other. But then AI became much more uh, akin to statistics and mathematics and kind of moved away from being inspired by humans. But my own research is very much inspired by how people learn, how children learn, and how people do the kinds of things that they do. And in fact, using a lot less training data, if you will, than these machines. Okay. And can we actually go through some of that? Let's go through some of those slides. So can you kind of walk the audience through the first slide here that we have um, and how this relates to your work? Yeah. So this uh, shows a little intelligence test. Uh, it's a test of abstraction and analogy. So I have three, uh, in the first uh, two columns, you see along the rows, one grid is being transformed into another grid. So the grid with a, a green stripe and a yellow stripe gets transformed just into the green stripe. And then go down uh, the, the green uh, s square and the pink object. I wish object. I had a laser pointer. Yeah, the pink object <laughs> gets transformed in just the green thing, and so on. And now those are three examples of a change. Now I want you to figure out what, is, what changed and apply that same change to the test input, the red and the gray. So what would you say? Me personally? Yeah. Me personally is that the red will stay and the gray box will leave. And what's the underlying rule? The, the, the shape underneath the top shape will be gone. Right. So that's, that's the right answer, right? Yes. So Human 100%. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's why they hired me. So this is really simple, right? Because it's, it, it, it uses your understanding of space and your understanding of notion of something on the top and something on the bottom. And that's, some general, that's a general sort of uh, concept that we humans have. And we gave this, these kinds of problems to humans and we gave it to GPT-4 both in sort of a text form and a vision form. And from this problem, they both got it. Humans got 100% of them got it correct, and GPT-4 got it correct. But does that mean that GPT-4 understands the concept of top and bottom the same way humans do? Well, unfortunately, you can't tell from just one example, because right. it might be using some other strategy. So let's do another problem that involves the same kind of concepts. I'm worried I'm going to get this wrong. OK, so here's another problem. And okay. what would you say? I would say that in the gray box of the test input, the first, like the very top row will be red. Exactly. So yes. color the top. So it's another <laughs> test of your understanding of top. Yes. Okay. Now okay. I'm going to show you two more. I'm ready. So, you know, humans, easy, GPT-4 got this correct. Great. But now let's probe a little more. Oh, so no. here are two different problems. <laughs> okay. One I, on the uh, left and one on the right. Okay. Okay. I got the left one. Okay, what's the left one? It's inverted. 
You're inverting it vertically. You move, you yes. swap the top and bottom, right? Just, just this way, not this way. Yeah. Not left, right, up, down. Exactly. What about the, the other one? Uh, <laughs> you're taking <laughs> the very, very top and the very, very bottom, and you're getting rid of it. Exactly. Okay. So you, human, you as a human got both of those correct. Ooh. Okay. And um, GPT-4 got them both incorrect. My job is not going to be taken. Great. Right. So uh, your job is safe for now. For now. If it involves telling something's on the top and the bottom. Right, which it is. And um, th th so these kinds of problems uh, are, are based on um, work that Francois Cholet, a, a researcher at Google, had proposed as a way of fairly testing humans and machines for understanding concepts. Okay. And we did ex um, extended experiments. To, to test these on humans and different kinds of machines and show that the, this prop, the, even though these systems can do things like pass the bar exam, oh, they, no. they can't do something that's extremely simple even for children because in some sense they're using their vast amount of training data to do things that we would consider hard, but they haven't, through all that training, learned to do some of the things that we would consider very easy. And this is something that we see in AI all the time. You know, we get machines that can beat us at chess and go. We get machines that can do much better at language translation than we can and so on. But the simplest things that are really at the core of our intelligence, they haven't yet mastered. Is it, is it that leap? Is it a connectivity leap? Like, you know, I, I taught physics for over a decade and it's like this idea of being able to relate this one thing, an idea to this next thing or idea, and that link isn't obvious. Absolutely. That's, that's the key, is, and I, I would call that an analogy. Mm. And that's what's happening here. You're making analogies. You're saying, oh, I'm going to do the same thing to some new situation right. or new picture that I did to these other things that I remember doing. And it's using your past knowledge or experience to apply to some new situation. And that's something that AI systems still struggle with. And is that the next path forward? Is that the next step? I think it has to be one of them mm -hmm. in order for us to really trust these systems with uh, dealing with our world. So what, what is another one then? So you said one of them is reasoning, one of them is analogy. What is another like next big leap in AI? Well, one of the things that you were able to do here is explain your reasoning. Yes. You told me the answer. I mean, that took years to get better at. Well, <laughs> you, you told me the answer, and then you said why it was the answer. Yeah. So AI systems will tell you the answer, but they can't, very often, they can't tell you why. And so explaining themselves, being able to communicate their reasoning processes will help us understand how they work, will help us trust them, and will help us understand when and where they fail. So this, this is actually addressing what we talked about earlier with this black, black box. If we don't know how they're doing it, then that's a problem. But if they can actually explain, then that's like another huge step. If we trust their explanations. Oh, they could lie to us? Oh, my gosh. That's something they do all the time. Oh, my God. Give me an example. Well, <laughs> they lie. I mean, they, they hallucinate is the right, word that the people hallucination, use. hallucination, yes. Yes, where they, they, they will, you know, you ask them, you know, please write a legal brief that makes my case and it will say oh yes well here are the five cases that are you know were done in the past and you say are those real cases and we'll say absolutely totally i you know i took them <laughs> cross my heart and hope to die sounds like and, undergrad <laughs> but then when it I turns out undergrad. they're not mm. <laughs> it made them up and it doesn't wow. know it made them up because it How doesn't does it not know well it doesn't really have a connection with truth it's, it's terrifying. It's generating words right. in a way that is statistically um, the, the, the most probable set of words to generate next. Yeah. But it's not grounded in the world of truth and falsity. And so typically it will say things that are true because they're statistically more likely, but often it will make things up. If you ask it, for instance, if you ask ChatGPT to list the, the books that you've written it will happily do so, and some of them might be the books you actually wrote, and some will be the books. I've written no books, so well, that would be awesome. It would be awesome. Yeah. It might be a good suggestion for a yeah. book that you, you I'll could write. I'll put that write. on my CV. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Okay, so how do we, this will be my last question because we are running out of time, I, but I'm very curious, how do we combat hallucination in AI? Well, this is what everybody's working on. Right now. Absolutely. Okay. And um, one way that people are trying is to connect these systems with like uh, ways they can verify what they've said. So like connect it with the internet, let it look up a web page and give the web page as um, a citation for what it said. But it turns out that sometimes it will get that wrong too. It will give a web page, but that web page didn't actually say the thing that it claimed it said. And you know, there's many different ways to try and get the system to be more truthful, but none of them have worked so far to completely eradicate these hallucinations and we really don't know what the right answer is. And that's where we're going to get at this conference. Somebody's going to become an AI, you know, a, a, a scientist in this field, and they're going to figure it out. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. This has been fascinating and scary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>